truly on everything that we set out to do, we, we really over delivered. Like I knew that online education had enormous potential. Uh, it's grown beyond what I think we thought was likely to happen. Um, and now we've just continued to raise our aspirations and now I'm, I'm looking to the future and thinking really big about what this college and really the university as a whole could do. This is the Geese Download, a podcast from the University of Illinois Geese College of Business. I'm your host, Tim Sinclair, and today we talk with Geese Dean, Jeff Brown. After nine years leading the Geese College of Business, Jeff is stepping away. But why? And to do what? And perhaps more importantly, what does the future hold for Geese without him at the helm? We'll answer all those questions and more next on the Geese Download. If somewhere, someone were to get you a card from Hallmark for this moment in your life, it would say, congratulations on your what? <laughs> uh, career transition? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's not a retirement. It is uh, stepping back from a job that I love to take a little bit of time to uh, reflect and to recharge and figure out what's next. I know sabbaticals are are popular or common in higher education. In the last eight or nine years since you've been dean, as I understand it, you have not taken one. Why not do that versus? So even more so, I've been in a, in higher education since 1999, and I've never really taken one. I officially had one one time. Uh, but I continued to show up at the office every single day and I was starting a new center and I probably worked as hard or harder that time than any other time. It just, I had a slight teaching reduction. Um, so sabbaticals are important in higher ed. They are a time to reflect, to step back from the day to day and think about your research agenda or think about the impact that you wanna have. Um, I have been supportive of many, many of our faculty taking sabbaticals, uh, roughly every seven years is when they're due. I just, and I basically haven't had one in a 25 year career. So I figured it was time, but taking a sabbatical as Dean is not very practical because we're not just doing our research. We're like running a program and a whole set of programs. And, um, and I also felt that when I stepped into this job, uh, I didn't think I would do it for more than 10 years anyway. There's only one shy of that. I think it's good for the organization to have some new leadership, new ideas, and this just felt like the right time. Well, we'll talk about what's next for geese or what you see as potentially being next, but do you know what is at least somewhat next for you? In the very short term, I do, meaning the next, you know, the rest of 2024, uh, it is a mix of um, some physical challenges and hopefully some intellectual challenges. Uh, the physical challenges, I'm taking some time to, like I'm gonna spend the entire month of August in Alaska. Uh, can do it, canoeing down the Noatuck River, doing some hiking, visiting some other parks. Um, so that'll be pretty out there. Like there are no cell phone signals for hundreds of miles. So that'll be a nice way to disconnect. But I've also got some time scheduled at Stanford. They have a Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm going to spend some time there as a visiting scholar, um, try to uh, reconnect with my own past research agendas, find out what other people are up to these days, do some mentoring of some junior scholars, um, and it'll be a mix of those kinds of things. Your vision for Geese nine years ago and where it is today, do those two line up? Uh, and if so, how? And if not, how? Yeah, well, incredibly well, actually. Uh, if anything, we just went a lot further than I might have thought possible. Um, in terms of the things that we focus on and what we tried to achieve, it's all pretty much there in my speech that I gave when I was applying for the job to the faculty. Maybe not in, in the same, not every detail is the same, but the big themes were there. You know, we were focused on um, really big ideas about democratizing higher education through online education. We were talking about um, uh, really raising our aspirations as a college um, and, and getting our alumni re-engaged and excited to support us. And I, I may have even mentioned nine years ago that I'd like to get a name on the college. We were able to do that. Um, it, we've really worked hard on our own identity 
both our external brand, but also our internal brand and our, our commitments, our beliefs, values, those sorts of things. Um, and truly on everything that we set out to do, we, we really over-delivered. Like I knew that online education had enormous potential. Uh, it's grown beyond what I think we thought was likely to happen. Um, and now we've just continued to raise our aspirations and now I'm, I'm looking to the future and thinking really big <laughs> about what this college, any really the university as a whole could do. Uh, any leader knows that sometimes you have to make unpopular decisions, oh, yeah. but you do it because you think it's for the betterment of the organization you're leading. You've, you mentioned online education several times. Was that the big one in your career of doing something that at least to some might have been unpopular or, oh no, what are we doing, but really in the long run turned out to be great, or, or is there something else that comes to mind for you? What's well, related to that, but it wasn't so much the entry into online as it was the decision about three years later to double down on online by bringing to a close our residential MBA program. So the, 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 the traditional on-campus MBA, the PMBA, the executive MBA, we, we closed all those programs, not because they were bad programs. They were actually very good programs. They were just small in terms of the number of people they were serving. And we realized that if we could redeploy those faculty resources and so forth into online to support what was already phenomenal growth there, we could have an impact that was many times as big. Um, that was a tough decision because I knew, first of all, it was completely counter to what other business schools were doing. Uh, second of all, this was before the pandemic. And so people had a very different view of what online was capable of. We knew what it was capable of, but a lot of people didn't. And I think there were concerns, would we do this in a quality way, you know, those kinds of things. And could we really survive without this residential program? Um, but, you know, we made the decision. We made the decision. We rolled it out quickly. Uh, and there was a lot of unhappiness. But it was the kind of unhappiness you almost want. And what I mean by that is the people that were most unhappy were the people that were really committed to the program. And I would say to them, in a way, it, it's nice to know that you're this upset because that means you cared. That means this program meant something to you, right? And yeah, there's a sense of loss that's associated with that. But the, the business case and the mission case for doing this is absolutely right. And if you bear with me, mm -hmm. I think you'll see that play out. And it did. Um, granted, the pandemic helped in that regard because suddenly every program in the world had to go online whether they wanted to or not. We had done it intentionally. They all had to do it reactively and we delivered a far better product. Um, but I, I like to believe that even absent a pandemic, um, we would have proven the model in the long run. Of all the things you have done over the last nine years or so, is there one that you would consider a crowning achievement or a story you most like to tell or something that stands out as this, this is the moment for me that I would kind of rise us to the top from my time? There's, um, there's two ways I would answer the question. One is a more general thing and then the other is that moment, right? The more general thing, the thing that I'm most proud of is that I think we've changed the culture of this place to make it an innovative, can-do, high-aspiration culture where people are excited to think about the future and to think big and to challenge the assumptions, some of which in higher ed have been around for hundreds of years, about how we can do things differently in, in the pursuit of our mission. And I think that has fundamentally changed in the last decade. And I think that will persist regardless of who the new leader is. Now, how does one encapsulate that in a moment? I'm going to have to go with the day that we announced uh, the naming of the college. And that probably won't surprise anyone. But it was such um, an incredible endorsement from a very successful businessman, Larry Geese, and his wife, Beth. Um, it was enormously a uh, proud moment for the college that someone believed in what we were doing, wanted to invest in us, give us the resources to allow us to just sort of catapult to the next level, give us an identity and a brand that we could really build around. 
Um, and the funny thing about that day, and this is actually the moment, that, that like instant in time, is Larry and I were meeting with some alums in another room. We were walking down the hallway to get to the atrium where the event was gonna take place. My greatest fear was that nobody was gonna be there. And I came around the corner on the second floor of Biff and I couldn't figure out what I was looking at for a moment because the place was so packed that you couldn't even see the flooring. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were not only, not only was every square inch of the atrium filled up, but like there were people on the balconies mm -hmm. and standing on the stairwell hanging over. And at that moment, I was like, oh my God, this is truly a transformative moment. And so that feeling I, I, will, I will never forget. And I think many would say lots of schools have had <laughs> endowments or gifts that have come in that have been many millions of dollars and have made a big big difference. What feels to at least to me to be a, a big difference about this one is that it came with Larry Geese. Yeah. Like he, what has that personal piece meant in addition to just the financial piece of what came with it? As gift? crazy as it sounds, the 150 million turned out to be a small part of the overall gift. Uh, that we got with the geese naming that the brand the name but really his active engagement and involvement the energy that he imbues into this place the excitement that he gets and the students get from interacting with one another the fact that he's willing to come down here on on um, you know for almost anything we ask him to do to talk to a class for the day that students declare their major signing day for uh, just about anything, like it generates an incredible sense of excitement. Plus, Larry's an enormously successful business person. He was already enormously successful but at the time he made this incredible gift and his success has only grown. Um, but he does it in a way that he is really a champion of purpose and of intention and of societal value. I mean, think about Madison Industries, which is his firm, Everybody in that firm, I, I don't care if they're working on the shop floor or they're in the executive office, every single person at his firm will tell you they're there to make the world safer, healthier, and more productive. That's the Madison way of doing things. And it's incredible to see that kind of leadership. And I see it, my leadership team sees it, the students see it, and that has helped shape who we are. Uh, and so it really has just been an incredible gift on so many levels. Is there another issue topic like online education was for you early on and something you championed and, and led geese through that you have in your sights for the future that, that you might tell the next dean, look, I think we need to think proactively about this thing. No one else is doing it or few else are paying attention. We need to turn our sights toward trying to do so I think I think the direction and the problem we're trying to solve is the same one, but the tools are changing. So what do I mean? I think a place like the University of Illinois should have a global land grant mission that is seeking to provide affordable, high quality education to anybody in the world that is capable of doing well here, right? Um, in order to do that, we have to think differently about how we educate. And that involves thinking about some, you know, potentially scary topics about what's the role of artificial intelligence in helping to create content. Uh, you know, we have the capabilities of, of creating a digital twin of you <laughs> and having it speak in another language from a script that AI produced and you don't necessarily even have to be part of that. Now, that presents all kinds of scary issues that need to be worked through about intellectual property and the role of, of, of faculty and all that needs to be carefully considered. But that technology is there and I view it as a massive opportunity that we should get out in front of and lead because this could be the way that the, like the University of Illinois could literally be impacting the lives of tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people around the world um, in a way that's totally consistent with our mission. Um, now that doesn't mean we have to be issuing hundreds of millions of degrees, because I think the degree model is kind of an outdated model too, because we're in a world where stuff's changing so fast, the idea that you can go to school for four years and then you're done, 
that seems kind of antiquated. People need to be able to come back and get access to tools and skills constantly throughout their careers. And I think we, I'm not saying we walk away from degrees at all, but I'm thinking we need to build on the margin. Look, in the future, we need to be building up our capabilities to engage with people all over the world at any time in their lives when they need it um, in a way that's affordable and accessible. And University of Illinois could be the place to do that first. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see that. It's fascinating that, you know, a piece of paper is then the end all be all that this person is then prepared to work wherever for the rest of their lives. And that's kind of what the degree model is. Expanding on that, and I know there's lots of potential ways to expand beyond just the degree. Would it be other little pieces of paper that they've done this thing? Or yeah. what, what's sort of yeah, in your I mean, head of how, how that would look? Well, let me tell you some of what we've done already is we've now launched more than a dozen uh, graduate certificates. And these are on the Illinois transcript. It's an official sort of credential from the university. But it's a certificate that comes from only taking three classes for credit. For a lot of people, that's all they need. They're you know 40 years old. They came up as an engineer, and now they're moving into management, and they need some finance. So we can do that for them. Imagine doing that at an undergrad level, too, at, at a whole bunch of different levels of, of knowledge and expertise. And then what we've done is we've said, hey, if you get a certificate or a couple of certificates and then you decide, you know what, I kind of like this and I'm finding it useful, I, I want to get a degree, you can stack those into a, a degree. Um, you may already be 40% of the way done with a degree because you've done these certificates. And then if you do like our one-year master's in management, you might decide, you know what, this is great. A few, few years later, you come back and you go, I want to do an MBA. Well, guess what? You don't have to repeat everything. You can stack that degree into another degree. That kind of modularity, I think, is needed. And in an ideal world, if I was like, you know, king for the day of all higher education, <laughs> I would allow this modularity across different universities and so forth. I mean, I used to say this purely as a thought experiment. Um, and now I'm kind of like, I don't know, maybe there's actually a model out there that could work. It's like, let's take an MBA. Um, why does somebody need to take all of their MBA classes from one institution? What would be wrong with taking a marketing class at Kellogg and a finance class from Geese and a leadership class from Harvard and whatever and compiling it together and kind of saying, look, here's my MBA. I went and I did the best courses at these different places. Um, I'd be pretty confident that Geese would capture a large share of that because we do online incredibly well. Um, but those are the kind of models I, I think people need to be thinking differently about. Um, and it raises a lot of important issues that people are going to care about, like you know, who's keeping an eye on quality and who's accrediting this stuff. Those are all things that need to be worked through. But to me, they're not obstacles. They're just problems that need to be solved along the way. Right? It sounds like a coalition of business schools could, in theory, get together and say, we're, we're going to do this, and you have a primary residence or you know, here's, and then you just share. Or, I mean, it or to be like, honest with you, the business schools never decide to do it, and somebody else figures out how to do it for them. Yeah. Like if employers ultimately said, like, I don't really care where your degree's from. I just want to see that you've got these skills and yeah. that you've done this education. We'll get some third party to, like, you know, designate that you've done it. Um, you know, look, we're seeing employers move toward more skill-based hiring anyway. They're carrying... I think less about the degree and more about what skills and experiences do you bring to the table, including educational. Um, so it may be that if education doesn't innovate, that others will innovate for us. I think it's better for the universities to lead that conversation, um, but not all universities have it in their DNA. I think this one does um, to, ver to, to a greater degree than most. The question is, do we have it in us enough to, to, to stay out ahead? And I'd like to think the answer to that is yes. We've talked about a lot of the successes, but what would you have done differently? Looking back, anything stand out? You're like, I wish I would have done X, Y, or Z. So nothing big. Um, I, I don't think we missed any major opportunities or made any big strategic errors or anything like that. I, I'm actually enormously proud of what we did. Um, would I do some of the things that we did a little bit differently? Yes, but almost nothing that has to do with external stuff. It was more, you know, some internal things where, you know, we were doing some incredibly innovative things here, and we were kind of breaking some China along the way, so to speak. Um, and uh, sometimes that's necessary in a university environment to 
bring about change where the environment's not suited to it. But, you know, I learned as I went, and I, I think um, I could probably go about some of those things in a way that might have been a little less uh, uh, disruptive to some, some uh, other units on campus or, or relationships on campus. It, it's a tricky balance to strike. Um, you know, universities have a shared governance model where faculty have an important voice. I'm a member of the faculty. I believe in that. I think it's really important. But it doesn't always, it, it doesn't always suit itself to rapid innovation and agility. And I think we've got some work to do on getting that balance right. And I, I push pretty hard against it. And in some cases, that was necessary. In some cases, I might have pushed harder than I needed to. But, um, but really, you know, I don't have... I don't have a whole lot of regrets, to be honest with you. It's a good place to be. A great place to be. You know, it's the old, uh, the old Frank Sinatra song, My Way. It's like <laughs> regrets I've had a few, but in the end, too few to mention, right? Yeah. That's, not yeah. the, that's not what I focus on. Love it. Um, when presidents change, typically there's a note or a letter left in the White House from one to the next. Uh, it hasn't always been the case, as I understand, but typically that's how it goes. Yeah. What would you say, and I'm sure you will get to, to whoever's coming in to to fill your shoes and take on that role? Any advice, any thoughts, any words of wisdom that you would offer to, to that next person? Probably a lot of things uh, when I really sit down and start to think about it. I, I think above all, what I would start with is enjoy every day of this job because it's an incredible privilege to be able to lead an organization like this. Um, to have the opportunity to make a difference literally in the lives of you know 10,000 students every year, in the lives of tens of thousands of alumni, the faculty, the staff, to be able to harness the incredible intellect and power and resources of an organization like this, not in the pursuit of just profit, but in the pursuit of a greater good and of a mission that we really care about, that's an incredible privilege. There aren't many opportunities like that in life. So just like enjoy it, right? Um, and, and, and see the fun in it. Um, also some advice I was given early on when it comes to thinking about doing big innovative things uh, was like think big, start small and scale. And, and I think as a practical matter, that's been really a good mindset for me to have, which is start with a big audacious vision. Like I just came back from India, right? And one of the things that I'm thinking about is how can we have an impact over there? And when I think about having an impact in India, I'm not thinking like how can we reach a couple hundred students? I'm thinking about the fact that in India over the next 10 years, they gotta figure out how to educate another 35 million students a year and they don't have the capacity to do it. So I'm like, okay, let's think big. How could we touch 35 million people half a world away? Now, I don't know what the answer to that is yet, but like if you start with those big questions, you're going to end up doing bigger and more impactful things than if you than if you think small. And so I would encourage that as well. I was on a marketing seminar once and they encouraged kind of that line of thinking. Don't start with a, a basic idea and then see what you can add to the top of it to make it bigger. Start with the one that's impossible and start paring it back until it's just possible yeah. and do that. That's exactly. the one. Now, and you know, when you look at a lot of the great business leaders and societal leaders over time, you know, whether it's Steve Jobs or whether it's Gandhi speaking of India, like they had a big vision. And then the question was, how do you get there? And even if you fall short of the big vision, you're going to make a whole lot more progress and do a lot more good in the world than if you started with small thinking. And that, that would be my my advice. It's the phrase, shoot for the stars, you might just reach the moon or something to that yeah. effect. To yeah, that idea. absolutely. Well, and you're the you're the sports guy, the, um, which it was one of the famous football coaches that said something about uh, chasing perfection. And you might never reach it, but you'll catch excellence. Mm, yeah, right? exactly same, right. Same idea. Exactly. A former university president at another university told me the story that when you become a dean or a president, you're supposed to leave three letters in the desk. And um, each time you run it, tell the new dean or whatever that when they run into a problem, to open one of the envelopes. And so the new dean comes in, has their first problem, and it says, blame your predecessor. So they blame their predecessor. They get through the crisis. They move on. They have another problem. Next envelope says, form a committee. 
So they form a committee, they get through it. The third crisis comes along, they open the envelope and it says, prepare three envelopes. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I've I thought about it. doing that. I'm sure, <laughs> hey, doesn't sound like terrible advice actually. We don't know for sure what Dean Brown has next or what advice he'll leave in those three envelopes. But we do know this, Jeff Brown has led well and the Geese College of Business is in a fantastic place because of it. Be sure to join us for the next Geese Download. In the meantime, you can learn more about the Geese College of Business at geesebusiness.illinois.edu.